Good afternoon. How are you all? Are you enjoying your day? Yep. Good. <laughs> I'm Joni Tornwall. I'm the Education Lead in the Digital Union. I am pleased to have here Victoria Geddes and Steve Acker. I want to give you a little bit of an introduction. Steve Acker is the Research Director at the Ohio Bookshelf Project, Ohio Board of Regents, and Ohio Link. Let me get out of the way here. There you go. <laughs> he is also Emeritus Professor at the Ohio State University. Victoria Geddes is the Director of the Digital Union at Ohio State. She, her current projects include convening a university-wide digital textbook committee and starting a research project on learning differentials among students using digital and paper textbook formats. I'll let them go ahead and get started. Thank you, Joni. Thank you, one and all, for coming to our session. Um, delightfully, we started earlier. That was we done by 5 o'clock instead of 3.20 the other side. I'm here to explain why we're not here. And actually, I'm here, as you can tell. And Vicki's here, as you can tell. But John is not here. John is the executive director of Ohio Link, and he has a lot of the capacity to think through this at the state strategic level. In fact, this afternoon, he's at state strategic level kinds of things instead of here. So I apologize on his behalf for him not being here. But he's here in spirit, and he worked with us in putting this together. Vicki? Thank you very much. So why are we here? It's a nice day outside. No, OK. <laughs> so student walks into a bookstore. Sounds like the beginning of a joke. They go into the textbook section, and they see, let's see, they could buy the new version of the book. Campbell's Biology, which is used in Bio 113, 114, new version costs $202. They could buy the used version of the textbook. Campbell's Biology used is $159. Or there's a little tag on the shelf saying they could rent the textbook, or they could buy the E version of the textbook, or they could lease the, I, the E version of the textbook. The choices are astounding, and you spend a lot of time standing there with your calculator trying to figure out what is the most cost-effective way to get the information that you need. Some students just give up, go home, and try and borrow the textbook from their roommate, use the book from the library, not venture into this world at all. But the possibilities are continuing to increase, and that's one of the reasons that we're here today. The state and the federal government are very interested in e-textbooks, digital textbooks, because they see the potential for cost savings. They see a potential, possibly, for real learning differentials using these kinds of platforms. And so what we're going to do today is go over what these uh, state initiatives look like. We're going to talk about why digital texts are important. And then we're going to engage you, we hope, um, in trying to figure out what your role is as a faculty member, a staff member, a student, somebody who's just interested in the world of digital texts in this new revolution as we see it. So I hope you appreciate our pun. This is an analog poll because you're real people and you're alive in front of us mm -hmm. instead of a digital poll. But we'd like to get a hand count of those in the room starting with Carmen and moving down this list. So how many of you have used Carmen, which is the oral learning management system if you're not part of the Ohio State University group? That's hard to count. OK, how many people have not? <laughs> so about six have not. I guess there may be 50 people in the room. So I'm going to put down 44 for Carmen. 44 for Carmen. Carmen's in the lead. How about a Kindle, which is an e-reader made by uh, Amazon? Counting other e-readers. Oh, interesting question. What do you think? Sure, any e Other e-readers. Oh, OK. OK, well, look, it looks like there are a couple of other e-readers in the room. If you use it as an e-reader, it counts. <laughs> are, are you counting, or am I counting? You're counting. Oh, I'm counting. I'll put your hand. I come up with about 24, 26. About electronic reserves. Something from our library colleagues. Used to. Used to. Is this current or past? Yeah. Well, this is a hard audience. <laughs> we don't want to qualify everything. I'm seeing 22. Uh, JSTOR. No so the research community is in there. Thank you, you're the other way around. We didn't use it. 
next time. It's about 30. And finally, read the newspaper online. It's a question of how many don't so much Kind of about 40, 42. Those are rough numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the majority of the people in the room using Carmen, the majority of the people in the room reading newspapers online, the majority of the people in the room using JSTOR, and about half, slightly more than half, using a Kindle or e-reserves. I'd like to take the opportunity to go through these really quickly because cannot locate the internet server proxy. Why not? Can I find this one? So our internet connection is, seems to be. Uh -oh. Unhappy. We need tech support. <laughs> Let's do this. No? That's not good. Here, you start talking, I'll find it. Okay, so <laughs> imagine looking at you all. <laughs> the Ohio Digital Bookshelf is a state-level project that began in 2010 with the largest course taught in the state of Ohio. Which would be? Richard? What's the largest course do you think taught in the state of Ohio? Psychology. Introductory, introduction to psychology. So there are 70,000 students who take intro psych every year. The Ohio Digital Bookshelf went around to all the different um, campuses and we worked with the five major publishers in psychology, which are Pearson, Cengage, McGraw Hill, John Wiley, and Bedford Freeman Worth. And we said, would you permit us to put your top selling <coughs> books, and they gave us all the top selling books up on the web, and offer them at prices 10% below course mark prices. So whereas the typical book in intro psychology is about $160, these books were available for typically about 50 or $55. And we were able to develop a community of the 70,000 students who should have access, who are taking this course on an annual basis. Schools that participated, there were 49,936 of them. It's like someone turned on the lights. And, and this, is, this is the website that describes those users and the number of students who were presented access to this material. There are, I believe, 23 schools. The challenge is we don't have good data from all of them. But I can tell you one outcome of this. The University of Cincinnati has adopted an intro to psych book based on this process, which is going to save their students $1.1 million in one year next year. So there are some benefits in thinking about all the alternative ways in which textbook can be presented for the benefit of students. I have a question on that. Sure. So you can save those students $1.1 million dollars or billion dollars. What about the people who actually buy the book? Do they just cost the cost of that book to go up? Because it, not it causes money. Fabulous question. I'm sorry to catch your name. Rob. Rob's question is, so now we're cannibalizing print uh, communication for the digital. Who gets the money? Uh, when you sell, of 100% textbooks, what percentage are, are used books? 75 to 80. What percentage of that 75 to 80 does the publisher get? Zero. The digital textbook cuts into the used textbook market more than it cuts into the new textbook market. So in actual fact, the digital environment is better for the publisher, and it's not as good for the bookstore. Yeah. So, so the total revenues go up on behalf of the content creators, if you will. If somebody gets hurt, I'm trying to get at there's, I mean, there's a trade-off when you do this. Correct. There's so a displacement. the job because we did this. Someone has to be retrained for a different kind of job, which is sort of like rail, railroad feather batters and stuff. Yeah, we've been talking about this in the physics department, and what I was told by our vice chair is that we, that is Ohio State, has this uh, thing signed with uh, Barnes and Noble, and the, that we're not allowed actually to let our students know that they could uh, get just the e-textbook for essentially $15 or whatever it is, that $20, whatever they're, they're allowing them to use it for. 
The other interesting thing was, if you bought the e-version, the publisher, Lee Sengage, was willing to send the book to the students. And they would take it back. They would include a postage pay thing to take it back, because the book costs three or four dollars to print. And they're trying to keep it off the used book market. If the student chooses to keep the book, they have to pay the full price. But I'm wondering if here we are at OSU talking about doing these other things, uh, are we going to get into trouble with the administration who are digging frantically to find money in the, the most unobvious and stupid places? <laughs> now, before we go further, I have to turn to my co-presenter and say, we, we could just sit down. I don't think we have to say anything else. These folks are going to carry the day. But you, you probably want to talk some more. Let's go through real quick, and we'll get back to all these fabulous points, because this is all true. And there's an answer to our colleague back there in physics, too. So next, Flat World Knowledge. Flat World Knowledge is the leading publisher of open educational resources. And we use them only because of that stature. It's not an endorsement of them as a platform, although I think they are doing some very interesting things. The way that Flat World works is if you go to the Flat World website, if you send your students to the Flat World website, they are <laughs> able to use the book at no cost for the entire term and beyond. However, they use the book at no cost in its full form and feature set, page by page by page, and they can't download it to their computer. How do you make money with this kind of a model? Advertising. Richard, huh? Advertising. Advertising is one way, but it's not really what they do. What they do is they use, this is an example of a premium service. So essentially, they find that 40% of those who go to this website and have the book signed by their faculty say, you know what, for $35, I'd like to have a black and white print copy that I can carry around because we're close to the tipping point, but it's still about 50-50 about students who prefer, in fact, it's higher than that to take the job who prefer print to digital. So they print black and white at about $35 a piece. They print full color at about $70 a piece. And they sell ancillaries like flashcards, problem sets, and things like that. So what I love about this model, and why we bring it to your attention, is because it puts the choice in the hands of the student instead of us, faculty, or intermediaries on behalf of the students. And we think this is a very significant and appropriate response to the uh, market conditions. And Ohio Scaffold to the Stars. This is a project in which um, Ohio Link, the State Library Consortium, is the uh, principal investigator on. And its main purpose. <laughs> it's not going there. Okay, we get to try to paint with words again. <laughs> so here's a question for any of you write a textbook? Okay. Three of us. Oh, good. Or, so here's the question. Do we as authors provide particular benefit on behalf of our students because we speak from a single voice? There's some regularity, there's some rhythm, there's some level that we continue to hit the same over and over again. It's a producer's model. The distinction is, oh, it's, now we're in the mobile version. That's interesting. What happens if instead you believe that the consumer is the appropriate way to aggregate content and build a modular textbook of many voices, sort of like a course pack. Which one's better? Answer? Never answered that question. It's always a trick question. The answer is both and. You want to be able to do both at the same time. So what Scaffold to the Stars does is it has aggregated a series of resources, open educational resources, which means that they're offered under Creative Commons license, which means that any of you can remix, reuse, reformat, as long as you attribute that original work to the author. Students need pay nothing for them, and you can modify them as you see fit. So if you build this corpus of materials. Should I be going somewhere? <laughs> yeah, we should. If you hit the login button, it's a different ex display than I was expecting. And you all can come in as Sally's student if you want. What will eventually happen is you as an instructor can go to this repository of resources 
And there are lots of them. There's Merlot, there's the Orange Groves, there's Connections, there's the Open Library Initiative of Washington that have these materials. What this does is it organizes them. It allows you as a faculty to put together, uh, based on your syllabus, these resources. And they show up as a, as a syllabus, of course, calendar, in which the students have access to that content. Um, well, I, I worry that we're going to go way too long. So if you'll permit me to move ahead, Sounds I good. think that would be the best thing. We'll, we'll come back to this if you want to see. But the key question is, do you believe in the authority of author? Do you believe in the authority of student user? And if you could do both, wouldn't that be an ideal scenario for you to address the problem? Is this me still? Yeah. OK. So who, uh, we had a conversation about Ohio State. Take a look at Indiana University. In my view, they're one of the leading institutions in the area of digital textbooks. And one of the things that they've done really well is they have a website at etext.iu.edu with <laughs> the their model. What they've done is they've partnered with a local organization called CourseLoad. And they have a relationship with McGraw-Hill. Anybody else? Five major publishers. Five major publishers where their materials are available around 40% of the cost of the new print book. And they're offering it as a package and has several benefits over other systems. Number one, the typical ebook expires in six, in six months, one semester term. A lot of faculty and educators don't like that because they think students should have libraries into perpetuity. I use got in the middle. You get it for as long as you're at IU. So you get four years of access. All these slides are going to be on the web somewhere, aren't they? Okay, so you don't need to write this down. Number two, OpenStax. This is out of this is a, a Hewlett project funded uh, out of Rice University. Physics book, 2012, open educational source. Vetted and reviewed at the same level that other physics books are done. That's one of their six leading texts that will be available next fall. So I'd love to have you look at it and tell me what you think about it. Cost to students? Nothing. Orange Grove, same thing happening down at Florida, except on a modular basis. Difficulty, you hit vectors, and you get a long list of information about vectors, and it's difficult for you to evaluate their assured quality and how to put them together in your course back. Open Library Initiative, the, the community college system in Washington spent, I don't remember how many, several hundred thousand dollars. And they said, faculty in the state, we, we bequeath you, bid, we'll take a look at your credentials, and we want 82 entire um, content packages at 30 bucks or less per student. And we want to make them available to anyone in the state of Washington, and anyone in the state of Ohio, anyone in the state of Kansas, Texas, you name it, open education resource. So that's their approach. In one year, they paid for the entire cost of seeding this program with the savings of native students. You want to explain what this is? Oh, OK. What this is is an emptier room than the one we've got in front of us. Nonetheless, the voice you're about to hear has got the potential for much more impact than, our word, than my words here. When, when Vicki hits this button, you're going to hear Cable Green, who came from the Ohio Learning Network here, who's now the uh, Director of Global Learning for Creative Commons, speaking to the Washington legislator. We may or may not let you out the door. That's something that uh, Vicki and I have been discussing. But if you do go out the door, we'd really like you to talk to your legislators about ways in which you can save some money and improve their learning outcomes. So when we hit this button, you'll hear Cable's short three-minute plea. If we have, I hope we have our audio up. Oops, going back. Did you hit? I'm not seeing her. There it is. OK, got it. Thanks, Chairman Rolf and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Cable Green. I'm the Director of Global Learning at Creative Commons here in support of this bill. Uh, as we discussed before, the internet, cheap computers, digital education content uh, has provided an opportunity for the first time in human history for everybody to get access to a high quality education for the marginal cost of zero. The interesting point for Washington today is that the state currently spends 64 million a year in K-12 textbooks. That number is then matched by local school districts for a total of about 130 million a year spent 
on commercial textbooks. The results of that investment are that the textbooks for our children are approximately seven to 11 years out of date. Those are OSPI numbers. Two, Washington is a common core state and will be updating its curriculum and textbooks to meet common core standards and 43 other states have that same need. Those states are already looking at open educational resources to meet that need. And third, the good news is um, even though this bill does talk about uh, the opportunity to develop new open educational resources and that's important, the good news is that Washington doesn't have to build anything new. In fact, there are uh, books just like these. This is a, a nonprofit called CK12 that develops high quality peer reviewed textbooks with rigorous quality assurance processes that cost zero for the four digital versions and to print this book out costs about four dollars. And so if you think about all that together, the old model, which is what we have today, what that gets our schools and our kids is paper only, expensive textbooks, seven to 11 years out of date, cost 130 million a year, and the kids can't keep the book at the end of the year, nor are they allowed to write in it, highlight, or use any of their other study skills. New model is there's a paper option that costs $4, the digital options are free on all the digital devices that the kids have, or, or even if they don't have a digital device, the print is free and available, or $4 and available. The books are updated annually, and they can keep the book at the end of the year because it only costs $4. So that's a, I would argue that's a significantly better. So Cable can talk forever on this, just like Vicky and I can talk forever on this, but I think you got the main point. There are alternate models that we should consider they're particularly valuable, or they're as valuable in the K-12 environment where people buy a single um, purchasing agent buys on behalf of 100,000 students. If you know a school district, a K-12 school district, who would like to talk to us about this, we would like to support them in that particular endeavor. It's something that we're able to do. Jerry? Are there only four people on that committee? There are only four <laughs> people on that committee, but through the power of television, they're all okay. getting this message hammered at them over and over and over again. No, there are many places. So I also wanted to make sure that you got a, you, a sense of what we're talking about when we're talking about digital text. So there are dozens of different platforms, um, different ways to look at digital text. Each of these has different afford affordances. So I just want to give you a quick overview of three of them. Course Smart is probably the closest thing to a uh, textbook experience that you would recognize. So. Uh, Course Smart, you go into it, you purchase your books. Um, if I could find where the login button went. Here we go. This is only provided by the major commercial publishers, by the way. So this, we're not, this isn't all about open education sources, it's about digital resources, on either in the traditional model or in different models. So, being a historian, I wanted to make sure that we had a history book to take a look at, so we're going to be taking a look at uh, Give Me Liberty, which is one of the standard U.S. history textbooks uh, used at colleges um, in your U.S. history class. Uh, and what you're going to see is pretty much a faithful reproduction of what the class looks like, or what the book looks like, if it wanted to show it to me. Here we go. <clears throat> There we go. So you can see it's got a preview on each page. Inside cover of the book, it's got a map. You'll notice that it has some things that you can do. You can add bookmarks, you can add notes. There's also a highlighting function in there. But in terms of what the student sees, it's going to be very much a replica of the textbook that their, student, their, their fellows will have in the classroom. A uh, second one that I want to show you is um, called No, and every time I say it, I think that's a really bad name for a company. Um, but I'm going to show it to you on the iPad, so it's going to take me a minute to switch over. It also has some nice affordances. It goes a little bit beyond what CourseSmart can do.
So no is organized. You have your, your courses, your terms, and you download your textbook into the class that you've got here. And so you can see right at the front that there's a journal possibility. Over in the white, it says course journal. And once again, I made sure we had a history textbook. But one of the more interesting books in here is an um, uh, anatomy book. And you can see it's got gorgeous illustrations, nice tablets. It's got some functions that CourseSmart doesn't have. It's got a journal ability. It's got a note taking. Um, so you can see the notes I was putting in, like, why are joints shaped like this? Um, and I can go to that spot. I should be able to go to that spot. Um, <coughs> it's also got a nice um, flashcard unit within most of these chapters, so you can go through the flashcards, learn the things that you need to learn, so we can say, do you know what a mitochondrion is? Do we know what a mitochondrion is? We can say, no, we don't, and so it stays in the stack. Ah, uh, but we don't know, do know what this is, so we know that perfectly, it comes out of the stack. So these are affordances that you're not going to have in your physical textbook, but you might be able to add to in your uh, digital interface. And then I just or, or paste uh, visuals on there? No. <laughs> it's, it's more, it's, there's more stuff than you can do with, with CourseSmart, but it's not, you know, fully interactive yet. Um, and these things change every day. There's a new company, one of these will go bankrupt, um, and it's, you know, you, we're clearly in the very early stages of these um, companies. So the last one I want to show you quickly is, uh, a company called Inkling, and they work with publishers. They have their own staff who go f through the books and add uh, additional things to the book. So interactive images, qu end of chapter quizzes, author interviews for some things. Um, so look, we can see the same history textbook in here. It's amazing. Um, and what's nice is that it's organized by chapter, and then you get the interior of the chapter here. You can read it just like any textbook. You're reading it, completely normal. And you can do the same things that you could do in the previous one. You can add notes. You can highlight. And then there are sometimes interactive images. So this is an image that shows you how a plantation changed over time, which you can see in the textbook is just two images next to each other. And then. This is a nice one. It includes an, an interview with the author. So you'll have a two-minute video with Eric Foner explaining why he wrote the chapter the way he did. And he's talking very, very quietly. Born out of slavery, complex ideas about freedom. Slaves think about So that's what history looks like in this context, but where this context really shines is when you can go into a science field or something with uh, activities that can be really complex. So I'm looking here at Campbell's Biology. This is the one that's $202 if you buy it new. And um, each of the illustrations in here has a little blue uh, icon on there if it does something different than just be an illustration. Um, so here you can take a look at structures of DNA. This is a linear form of glucose. I can twist it. Uh, there are images that allow you to test yourself. Uh, there are images like this that are sequential. You can see how things change. And this is actually my favorite illustration in the entire book. We're going to go into the maple leaf to see its cellular structure. deeper and deeper until, voila, there we are. <laughs> and then at the end of every chapter, there is a quiz. So we'll see how well we do here. So which of the following categories includes all the others in the list? 
monosaccharide, disaccharide, starch, carbohydrate, polysaccharide. Oops, I already, already did this one. <laughs> we'll keep going here. Okay, which of the following statements concerning unsaturated fats is true? They are more common in animals than plants. They have double bonds in the carbon chains of their fatty acids. They generally solidify at room temperature. They contain more hydrogen than do saturated fats having the same number of carbon atoms. Or E, they have fewer fatty acid molecules per fat molecule. And the answer is? Boy, a whole room with not a single biology person in it. Very nice. D. D? Let's check our answer. Oh, try again. E. e. Let's check that. Not quite. <laughs> See, we're, we're just going to do this till we get it right. <laughs> How about B? Anybody? Oh, that was it. <laughs> okay, so you can see that possibly with these, you're getting more than what you would with the physical textbook alone. And I just realized we have to switch back to the other. Uh, there are ones that allow you to annotate and take notes. Uh, both Inkling and um, Court and uh, No allow you to basically make it a social experience, so you can add notes or questions in it and share those questions with other people also using the book. The, in Inkling, I think it is you can follow people. So if your faculty member goes through the book and says, you know, this section really, really important then all the students who are reading that section can see that note, which is, could be a very useful kind of thing, but, but that you can't make it new yourself. But on the other side of that question, as, as, a, as the faculty presentation course, I can edit anything in the Flatwell textbook. I can edit anything in McGraw-Hill's Create and Connect systems. So I can recreate the book specific to my interests, cut, add, truth. Um, I know probably a little bit more about flat world knowledge uh, textbooks. You can actually customize to select the content you want to use and leave out the content that you do not want to use. You can add multimedia content yourself as a note, and you can include lots of links and uh, even any other interactive material in that textbook that's not written by you, but somebody else written the textbook and then they publish that. And that all the electronic material still to students is zero dollars, so it's completely free. So that, that platform gives uh, faculty a little bit more option in terms of how you can change the way you want this textbook for uh, your class use. Uh, there are many other different things. And I'm so excited about the, uh, the iBook offer as well. I don't know if anybody tried anything. So that can give you a lot more power, but it's an it's a <coughs> Apple-based platform product. So I don't know a way you can publish that into a browser. I believe you have to use the iPad. So the fun thing is, because Ohio State and Wright State and others have have decided to go to semesters next term, and I know that is a painless <laughs> procedure for everybody. Um, but in th this kind of technology, when you taught in the quarter system, you could just knock out those six chapters that were inappropriate for your 10 week quarter and say 17 week semester and remove the clutter from the perspective. All right, so you were so. <coughs> I'm not sure we should do this again. They really destroyed our last poll. We'll try again. And it's got to be better this time. How many of you have shown a PowerPoint in class? So 30 ish. <coughs> Made electronic comments on the paper. 20 ish. Sent an email to your <coughs> colleagues and students. <laughs> Performed committee work in a learning management system, Carmen of Case, Ohio State. Okay, so we've been leading up to this. How many have you assigned a digital test? Bingo. Bingo, bingo, bango, four. Four? Oh, I was counting for that. Four. How many did you count? I counted four. Or you counted five, five. five. Okay. I'm sorry, how many did you count? 
I counted five. You counted four. And how many have used these other technologies? Uh, let's see. The learning management system was 44. That's about 10 times more. Email, everybody. About six times. Oops, 100. <laughs> JSTOR, about 30. So six times as many. Five. Right. And that is four we can buy by that really easily. But you see, the, so okay, now the next question, right? This is, this is the payoff. What do we think is good about digital textbooks? These are some of the big ones, eh? There's the potential, not always the case, that it saves money for the In my opinion, I may speak for Vicki as well, watch your nonverbals. I think that the commercial textbook providers do fabulous work in terms of constructing content. I think that the business model has to change. And that's what we think that these digital environments with special potential resources can do. Change the uh, business model such that those who have spent corporate careers <coughs> in this realm of creating intellectual property for students' use can do so, but just offer it under different terms. I think Vicki's presentation of particularly Inkling showed some of the richness that's available in the digital environment. Do you want to do the next three? We can integrate multimedia. You saw we could do video inside these. And it's consistent with future and some <coughs> student practices. There's a Gartner report out now that says that the future of e-textbooks is maybe five years down the road in terms of mass adoption. Um, and, but that it will be students who are currently in middle school now who will be hitting that point when they get to college. On the other hand, the limited licensing refers to the fact that they have bonds in the uh, digital rights management so that they expire after a quarter, after a semester. That some publishers, Cengage in particular, you can buy extensions. Not everybody is, in fact, the data still show that students prefer print to digital, but it's very close to that tipping point. Once we hit that tipping point, you're going to see this kind of change potentially. You need connectivity, and sometimes the technology doesn't work. And, and this is your chance. Please join the conversation. You've been very good so far in letting us, unfortunately, talk more than you. But now let's get down to some of the ends. Oh, thank you, Ben Beck. I've been, uh, I've been wanting to say something. I'm a university librarian. I'm the human college library. And I'm certain that our director from Ohio Lake would point out some very significant, important points. I buy digital textbooks for human ecology for the tradition. We, uh, for others like physics or history, just tell us what books you need, textbooks, because it just depends upon the publisher and we'll purchase it. And the great thing about getting those digital texts is that you have multiple user rights. In the licensing, we don't have to worry about the licensing because like from Springer, Elsevier, uh, Oxford and others, you know, we buy the book and we keep it as long as, as we want to. So, depending upon what area you're in, please contact your subject librarian and he or she will get the materials you need. <coughs> uh, we're so lucky in that uh, our academic uh, generation, you have a world of information at your fingertips. The problem is you don't know where your fingertips are going. So please contact your librarian because we'll get all we'll get all that. And one of the things that if you don't mind, one of the things that I I I found is that the publishers, they're not they're not going through they're not selling directly anymore. They're selling through like book jobbers like uh, OSU, we use uh, Yankee Book Peddler, which basically used to just sell sell books, print books, but now they're selling digital books. So we don't have to worry about the licensing or, or any of that anymore. They, uh, Yankee Book Keller uh, does it. And you've probably seen some information about eBrary. That's Yankee Book Peddler. So just tell us what you need and we'll get it. Thank you. And oh, and so, just talk to your library because there's so many cool databases, especially from Ohio, like that you just would just blow your mind. See, we're going to get at least 25% more adopters because I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Lita Hendricks? Because of what Lita said. And Jesse, I saw you shaking your head quite a bit. Could you contribute yeah. to that um, comment? Just as a, uh, as a grad student, um, 
the in particular Spiro link, the, the, oh, yes. the e textbooks that are available, the e books, um, not necessarily textbooks, but they're so, they're so useful. And the ability to just use it right within your browser, right as you're searching through the library online catalog, is, is amazing. And it's great to be able to have that. So uh, I've used it many, many times. Okay. Uh, the observation from experience. Yes, sir. For the consumer who just had to buy from the course mark for her middle for middle school. I'm missing where I'm saving any money for this. Okay, so fabulous point. So the net cost of use is the way we should evaluate the potential savings associated with any of our distribution models. The typical course mark pricing is within the domain of what it happens if you buy a book used and sell it used. So the price differential, in all cases, can't be demonstrated by the individual. But now we switch to the learning outcomes, right? Because what we're interested in is return on investment. How much learning per dollar can you get? So we need to demonstrate collectively whether there are true savings in digital. And there certainly are no open education resources. There certainly is every two and a half years when the publication cycle changes and that use book goes to zero. Or we can improve learning outcomes. If we get higher numerator and lower denominator, we win. So we've got to work on both sides of the course. So very fair question. It doesn't always save the money. Can we work as a community to improve learning outcomes? But it can save you could. Thanks for that. But we need the ands. We've got two ands and one but. Jerry? <clears throat> I think one interesting thing, we're talking about textbooks here in an entity. Uh, in many cases, students who was bypassing books, Khan Academy being a classic example, where they're going just to get a small segment of what they don't understand, or more clarifications for it, they're bypassing totally the book technology. And I'm wondering if maybe the e-texts are kind of too late, not quite fitting the current students' needs in their acquisition of information. So there's an argument for the student voice as consumer. And, the, and a great way, by the way, if you're interested in digital, is to continue your, your current practice of however you're choosing to adopt the book. We use the digital as supplemental materials to see if you like them, if your students like it. But a combination of both, perhaps, would be the best model, where exactly. you, you take a segment of this, a segment of that, and a segment of something else. Right. And Student per their, their, their data suggests that 25 percent of students are, are choosing not to buy at all the new textbook because of the price. And what does that do to your learning environment in class? So we need to address it. Scott? Um, I'll just say this real quick. This, I want something between pro and con. Uh, maybe a reality check. Okay. Um, I've heard a couple of people mention this idea of the textbook can be updated every year and we can keep it up to date. I'm a textbook author and my textbook is digital and that was put on me. It's absolutely exhausting. Um, and we've got this real romantic notion that because it's digital, we can just go in and change a couple things and that's going to be a real easy process. And I think we need a reality check about that because if it's done well, it's not an easy process. It's sometimes rethinking conceptually about big pieces. It's not just changing the thing. So another terrific point. So this is an argument in favor of the authorial voice that, that as someone who's thought about this for a very long period of time, you've established a sequence and structure that's especially valuable for your students and others. And mine's my, a, a more conservative digital textbook. I mean, I love the models that you were talking about for, the, for this kind of model. And, but what may happen is if I can use that structure, and this is sort of the Xanadu model, I can nip the edges. I don't have to change your structure, but I could put one or two different ways of expressing some of your thoughts on sentence structure, whatever you were happy to write about. So not to, not to violate the way in which you think the competitive should occur, but to extend it to alternatives. And yes, it is not something that we can blithely just recreate the new textbook on the fly. In fact, one of the big challenges is when you do that, you end up generating multiple ISBN numbers. And now it becomes difficult to find out how to buy them and stuff like that. So great point. Yeah, to that point, there's actually some uh, new technology coming down the pipe. There's new brokerage systems that allow you not to just slice and dice uh, a particular text, but uh, if they use standards like Common Carter. It allows you to integrate that content within your course curriculum and have more dynamic, diverse cross-section of materials. You also have test banks, rubrics, assessment models. Um, I've seen some pretty slick tools that haven't officially been released yet, but uh, what's coming down the pipe is pretty exciting. But it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the desire to learn will support 
because they're kind of behind the eight ball versus what some of the other ones are. But uh, you know, it's it's as you said, five years from now, I don't see e-text just being you know just simply anymore. It's not going to be just an e-text. It's going to be part of a supplement to a larger uh, curriculum. Right, and right now the estimates are that the market is about three percent of the entire textbook market. So we're still on that really, really Down thin. Here leading there. edge there in terms of, I mean, if you go over to the bookstore and walk up and down the aisles, there's like an orange tag for which ones have a digital text. It's like one in 30, I mean, as you're walking along. It's not every textbook has a digital version of it out there. And as you were obviously seeing, they're not all on the same platform. So, you know, you assign me one in Inkling and you assign us one in CourseSmart and then you, in a, and I want that quiz material that was in the last one to come back into Carmen. How do we do that? You know, that's that's going to be really tough to figure out. I think another issue that always worries me is literally shelf life. So we all have materials that we created ten years ago that only were born digitally and are there, but yet because of our propensity to chase the new and the shiny. Operating systems change, delivery platforms change, proprietary file formats change. So we all have materials that we're very proud of that we will never be able to sort of retrieve. So as we move <coughs> forward, I, you know, there is a challenge to think about digital preservation. And it's not just having a backup copy, because that's clearly not sufficient. Yeah, the backup copy is something that reads the old copy. Yeah. Do you still have those punch cards? You <laughs> 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 said you deal with the question of OSU not allowing us to get uh, let the students just buy the digital thing and bypass the bookstore. Which way? I I hadn't heard that when you said that. That was news to me. Well, that's what I was told by our vice chair, and he says that if we have that OSU gets the kickback from Barnes and Noble on books that Barnes and Noble textbooks Barnes and Noble sells to students and uh, so they're again having this this kind of uh, thing. Sungate was uh, they made a presentation I attended it was really good and they were they're willing to give you a three ring binder of the book in color for another five dollars over the electronic price because you can't sell that back. exactly it that's controls really it more. what they don't want is to you to get their you're absolutely right about this they want to get rid of the used textbook market. Right. Well, the Revised Higher Education Act, though, requires us to present students with as many options as there are available. Right, so the, both of those are correct. So my view is there's a technology called Verba that's in use at Bowling Green, is a good example. You should share it with other instructors and with our bookstore, with the bookstore of Ohio State. What Verba does is you go to the, you go to the Bowling Green bookstore and you say, I want to buy Campbell. And just before you hit that button, it says, buy now, it says, but wait. And it shows you where you can buy that same book at different prices. So you would ask, why would a bookstore do that? Would you have an answer for that? I'm presuming if they're doing it, that they get a kickback. There's an affiliation fee. And what it is, is the bookstore, everyone is aware, I believe, that, this, that the models has to change. There's this tremendous tension breaking down the walls. Barnes & Noble has some number of years in the contract with Ohio State. And whatever's enforceable in that period of time will change at the next one. So that's one thing. Everyone's looking for a new model for bookstores to stay involved. You know, the bookstore used to be like the library. My next door neighbor um, ran the bookstore um, back in the 70s. And he, it was just like the library. The purpose was they would walk Vicky in, they'd say, what do you need? And they'd show the book. And they'd, it wasn't about making money at the university. We get hit by these financial spikes and we change different functions for different departments. And news, time to change it back. So number one, uh, the limits are, are there. Number two, there are alternatives. Number three, less than 50% of textbooks are purchased at the bookstore. Now, the rest are bought at app.com. They're rented. They're made available through Amazon. So the bookstores are fighting a rear guard on that particular model. So you, you may not be able to you know, wave a flag in favor of alternative ways of getting your book, but students buy books all over the place. They don't just buy it from the bookstore. Steve, I hate to do this, but we are the only thing standing in, in the way. way of the raffle. So if you can <laughs> fill out these, hand them in, and then race to the auditorium, because it did say, be present to win. Uh, 
but we made we were trying to make sure that everyone here bound to evaluate whether they would like to offer this in the class. So take that with you and talk to your colleagues, talk to our librarian friends, talk to our experienced users. Speakers actually lock the doors. You can't yeah, so you can't get out. Sorry about that fire marshal. No big, no big deal. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We appreciate your time.